Good morning and happy 4th of July. Today is a day that we set aside to celebrate uh, our independence and our, our nation's birthday. It's a day that we're probably later going to have barbecues and, and uh, maybe eat some ice cream. In fact, in the in-service church uh, or in-person church today, we're going to have popsicles afterwards. It's a great day to get together with family and friends and, and just to, uh, to celebrate and enjoy the summer. But I'm glad that we can be together this morning to begin our day, to begin our week by worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to remember that our life, our eternity, our every day, our every moment is secure in him because of what he's done for us. So let's go into a time of worship to lift up the name of Jesus and to glorify him for all that he is and all that he has done for us. I 
you surpass her. If this life I lose, I will follow you. Yeah, I will follow you. Yeah. Light into the world, light into my life. I will live for you alone. You're the one I see, knowing I will find. I need in you alone, in you alone. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. If this life I lose. Good morning. Would you turn in your Bible to Psalm chapter 138? We're going to begin reading with verse 1 and we'll conclude with verse 5. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I call, you answer me. You greatly embolden me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Would you join me in prayer? Eternal Father, we, like David from so long ago, give to you our praise, for you are the living, holy, and merciful God. You are the only God, and you know us fully. You also hear us when we call, and you answer us perfectly in every regard. We pray for strength and faith as we continue to learn to wait and trust you in all things. Lord, keep us from the temptation to lean on our own understanding. Forgive us for the many times we do yield to fear and faithlessness. Renew us so that our physical and spiritual eyes will look to you for our security rather than the powers of the governments and institutions of this world. We pray that the day comes soon when all the kings of the world will praise you. Come soon, Lord Jesus. We give thanks to you individually for the mercies and blessings you so bountifully gave us this past week. Your faithfulness never ceases. May we, Lord, extend the same mercy and blessing to those we meet in our walk this week. As your Holy Spirit continues to bear its fruits within us, may we hear with clarity its instructions during our divine appointments. 
Lord, we pray for our city, our state, our nation, and our world. The spiritual darkness, so prominent, seems overwhelming, but we know that it is not. The light of the world is working constantly, and he commands us not to fear. Paul reminds us that it is not about us, but about Christ. As he writes, we can do all things through him. Thank you, Lord, for your presence and your strength. Lord, we pray for individual members of our church. We pray for their walk with you, that they may abide in your word and in prayer. We pray for physical healing and strength where illness and weakness have been present. We also pray for travel mercies as they travel this week. And Father, now we pray that our lives bring glory and honor to you and our worship is done in spirit and truth. Thank you for the ministry of Seth among us. He does so only to bring glory and honor to you. Bless and empower your words as he humbly presents them for the growth and salvation of those who hear them. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. When I first met my wife, Christy, she had a 1978 Volkswagen bus. It was light green with a white top, and on those buses there's this ridge or a body line that runs around the whole thing just underneath the windows. And all along that body line she had painted sunflowers. And then the spare tire hung right in the middle on the front under the windshield, and on the spare tire cover she had painted a giant sunflower, and under that she painted the name that she'd given her Volkswagen bus. Sassy. Sassy the bus. Well, Christy loved that van, and it was really cool. I liked it too, but it was also a lot of work. In fact, the first time I ever met Christy's dad was when her van had broken down, and he and a neighbor of theirs had driven up from San Diego, where Christy grew up, to our college in Fullerton, California, which was in Orange County. And in fact, he made that trip every few months because something on Sassy the bus would need to be fixed. Well, Christy and I dated for a couple of years, and on May 23rd, 1998, we got married. And that day I knew I was gaining a wonderful, beautiful wife and great in-laws. But what I didn't know that I was gaining was something else. By marrying Christy, I also gained the title of head Volkswagen bus mechanic. When we got back from our honeymoon, Christy's parents drove up to help us unpack our wedding gifts and set up our apartment. And after we had gone through and opened all the gifts and gotten things organized, Christy's dad said, come with me, I've got something else for you. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, some family heirloom, some special wedding gift that they'd gotten for us, I didn't know. But no, it wasn't either of those things. When we got to their car, he opened the trunk and he said, this is for you. And he handed me a toolkit and a coffee can full of bolts. And then he walked with me out to where Christy's bus was parked and we got down and climbed underneath and he showed me where that the drive lines on each rear wheel attached just directly to the wheel and those drive lines just bolted on with six small bolts and if you've ever driven an old Volkswagen bus you know it's kind of fun but it's also kind of weird because you're basically sitting right on the front wheels just above them so you don't just turn like a normal car. It almost feels like you're swinging out and around in front of the car. And that makes it easy to cut a corner too closely. And then you have the rear wheels hit the curb. And when those rear wheels hit the curb too hard, those bolts holding the drive line to the wheel just shear off. And then the drive line is in there thumping around and slamming into things. So suddenly that coffee can that he had given me made sense. It was full of new replacement bolts for the drive lines. And the tool kit he gave me had a tool in it for removing the sheared off bolts when they were broken. And it had the right size Allen wrench to install the new ones. And then he put the can of bolts and the tool kit in the back of the van and he slapped me on the back with a big smile of relief knowing that he would never again have to replace those bolts. And he said, have fun with that. And I really didn't think too much about it until a few weeks later when we were pulling into the bank parking lot and Christy cut the corner too close and hit the curb. 
And I knew when I heard that thumping and rumbling sound that came next, I knew immediately what it was. And it could have been a time for panic if I didn't know what was happening, but I was prepared. I had the right tools and the right preparation. I was able to replace the bolts and get us back on the road pretty quickly. I hadn't known just how practical that information was when her dad was telling me. But in that moment, and all the times that those bolts sheared off again after that, I was glad that someone had prepared me with the understanding and the knowledge to handle that situation. And what I learned through that, and a lesson that I think we see as we go through chapter 10 of the book of Acts today, is when we learn something, we rarely understand its full value. There's a saying that no education is ever wasted, meaning even if you never directly use the knowledge that you've learned, learning it is still worthwhile. And I tend to agree with that concept. And part of that way of thinking is to have a mindset of always trying to learn. I think there's a biblical concept that ties in with that idea, too, of no education ever being wasted, because God is constantly teaching us and shaping us, and we probably won't know exactly why until the opportunity to glorify Him or to help somebody else presents itself. And today, as we pick up in the book of Acts, we are going to see just how God is at work in two very different people that are in two very different situations in very different places. And we'll see how God works out his will through them. And I want to start today with a verse that's not in the book of Acts, but I think it applies to what we're going to be talking about. This is a verse that you've probably heard before. In fact, it seems like almost everybody has their own take on this verse, their own opinion. Some people find it encouraging, while some people find it frustrating. Some people even find it maddening. It's Romans 8, 28, and it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, like I said, people have mixed reactions to this verse. But I think that's because we put the emphasis on the wrong parts of this verse, usually. No matter how we feel about it, where do we usually put the emphasis? We emphasize the good to those who love God part, right? Because that's us. So we can start to think, well, if God is working for my good, then I should just expect good things. But when those good things don't come, we get confused. And that's because we make the mistake almost every time we read Scripture. We start with us at the center and go from there. But whenever we read Scripture, we have to start with God at the center and apply His truth to ourselves, not the other way around. When we do that, I think the emphasis in this verse is then on all things together and according to his purpose. The phrase there, all things together, really does mean all things, everything. The original word means every part or every kind of. And every kind of thing includes bad things. It includes hard things and ugly things. A lot of those things that don't seem good to us at first glance. And it doesn't mean that God causes those things to happen to us, but it means that he can even use those difficult things for our good and for his purpose. Because if we're called according to his purpose, then our idea of what's good or even good for us, it changes. And today, as we move into chapter 10 of the book of Acts, we're going to see how God's purpose and the idea of what's good changes things in a big way. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about Saul his conversion, and how he went from persecuting the early church to preaching the gospel. But today, we're going to see what Peter, one of the original apostles, is doing. He has traveled from Jerusalem to places like Lydda and Joppa, and he's preached the gospel, he's healed people, he even brought a woman named Tabitha back to life. And seeing the opportunity to continue teaching these people, Peter decides to stay in Joppa for a while with a man named Simon, who was a man who was a tanner. So Peter's going about his business, doing what Jesus taught him to do. But things are about to change because God is at work about 33 miles away in a place called Caesarea. Acts 10, 1 through 8 says, At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. 
One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who had spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He also, or he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Here we're introduced to a man named Cornelius. As a centurion, he would have been responsible for the command of a hundred other Roman soldiers. But the thing that we see most clearly in this verse is that he is a God-fearing and devout man. In Caesarea at the time, there were tons of spiritual and religious influences. There were the Hellenistic religions, Judaism, uh, and there was a large temple to the pagan god Pan there. So we don't know if Cornelius had converted to Judaism or if he was a sort of God-fearing man in the sense that he knew that there was one all-powerful God in the universe and he prayed to him. Whatever the situation was, he understood that it was important to pray and to help those who were in need. And God recognized and honored those efforts because he ended up sending an angel to Cornelius who told him that God appreciated that. Now it might make you uncomfortable to hear me say that Cornelius might not have known exactly which God he was praying to, that he might not have completely understood the concept of the one true God, Yahweh. It almost sounds like that idea that's so prevalent in our culture today, just like it was in Caesarea in this day. The idea that all roads lead to God or that everyone can just live their own truth and everything will work out fine. The misguided idea that you know, all religions are basically the same and you can just sort of choose one if you want to feel spiritual. But that's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, I think that God illustrates clearly in what happens here that not all roads lead to God. He shows that what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 is true. He said, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And then Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Just look what God did with Cornelius here. He sees the sincere efforts of this devout Gentile man. His efforts and actions come up as a memorial offering before God, and God says, good job, Cornelius, come into my kingdom and enjoy your reward. Your good deeds have saved you, right? No, God shows us here doing good things is not everything. In Christ, we are saved by grace through faith, not by our actions. Salvation is a free gift through Jesus, yet it comes with the expectation of obedience and right actions. And this is a concept that's been hard for humans to grasp since the first century. I hear so often people say, I'm a good person. I try to be kind to people. I've never killed anybody or anything. And first of all, if that's where we're drawing the line, not killing anybody, if not killing anybody is, is the bar that we've set for being a good person, I think we need to readjust things a little bit. But that kind of thinking comes from the misunderstanding that our goodness is based on our actions and not the righteousness of Jesus. In this passage, we see that Cornelius really is a good man, but God shows us that there's something more that he needs than just prayer and helping the poor. And it's so important that God sends an angel to him to tell him where he can find Peter who can tell him what's so important. And to his credit, Cornelius believes God's message and he sends some of his men to Joppa like the angel told him to do. But it takes two to tango, so to speak. And if Peter's not ready for what God has asked Cornelius to do, this whole thing could go off the rails. But God's already at work ahead in Joppa so that the obedience of Cornelius can be rewarded. So let's read Acts 10, 9 through 16 and see what God's up to. It says about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. 
he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. What is God even doing here? This is so weird. I mean, what in the world does this have to do with a Gentile centurion named Cornelius who had a dream in a totally different city? While it may seem like a very strange dream to us, for Peter, this dream had a very deep meaning. Commitment to and obedience of the Jewish law, especially the law regarding what was clean and unclean, was a source of pride for the Jewish people. They were taught from the time they were born not only what was clean and unclean, but to never, ever touch anything that was impure. As Peter says here, he had never in his entire life eaten anything that was laid out in the law as unclean or impure. And because this way of thinking according to the law, was so ingrained into the Jewish people, it was something that they saw as one of the biggest dividing points between them and the Gentiles. They considered Gentile people themselves to be unclean and wouldn't even want to associate with them. But we learn something from Peter's situation here. What God teaches us will help us proclaim the gospel. We may not understand it for weeks or months or years, how a lesson from God that he's taught us is going to help us in spreading the gospel. And Peter here is lucky enough that it happens quickly for him. When he's had this vision, he's confused too, but God doesn't waste any time in giving Peter an opportunity to apply what he's learned in real life. In Acts 10, 17 through 20, it says, while Peter was still wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. See, twice in these verses it says that he was wondering about and thinking about this vision. He was trying to figure out how this could possibly apply to him. And then, right at that moment, a divine appointment. God brings the men from Cornelius to the house at that exact time. Just a few minutes before this, Peter would not have wanted anything to do. He wouldn't even want to be in the same room as these Gentiles. But because he knows that he's called according to God's purpose, he now welcomes the men and he meets with them. They tell Peter that Cornelius had sent them because of what the angel had said in his dream. And the next day, Peter, this Jewish man who had worked so hard to obey the laws of cleanliness, he set out for a Gentile's house. In Acts 10, 24 through 28, we see what happens. It says, the following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am, not, I, I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate or visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or in, unclean. See, even though he had started out being confused by this strange vision, Peter has now put it all together. After Cornelius then explains about the message the angel had given, uh, Peter continues in verses 34 through 35. It says, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And then Peter goes on from there to preach the gospel to them. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they're baptized. And Peter's doing exactly what Jesus told him he would do. Peter is being his witness. The gospel started in Jerusalem, had spread to to Judea, Samaria, and now it's beginning to spread to the Gentiles in Caesarea. And Peter is part of the gospel beginning to spread to the ends of the earth, just like Jesus said. It wasn't the way that Peter had planned, 
It wasn't something he was used to. It was something different than what he'd done all his life. It was out of his comfort zone. It was a major change for him. But it was what he was called to do because it was according to God's purpose. And this is something that we see over and over and over again in the book of Acts. God's spirit is moving. Miracles are happening. People from every tribe and tongue and language are being saved. And all of it is happening because of God and his people working hand in hand. God is working ahead, working things together for the good of his people and for his purpose. And his people who are called according to his purpose, remembering what their purpose is and stepping out into the opportunities that God puts them into. And God is still at work through his spirit and his people today. He's at work in us, in his church. So whatever God is teaching you, remember that you may not know its full value until he puts you in a right situation. And to understand what he is teaching us, we have to put him at the center, not ourselves. We need to keep his purpose of reconciling people to himself through Christ at the center of everything that we do. And as he teaches us, what we learn will help us to work toward his purpose. So let's step into that calling and let him work all things, even difficult, uncomfortable things, together for good in the ways that only he can as we keep working toward his purpose. Let's pray. Father, thank you for calling us according to your purpose. We want to be people who work toward that. And we know that you will work all things together for good for us in the big picture of things. Things may not always be good. Things may not always be easy. But if we're working toward your purpose and called according to your purpose, you are going to work through everything, even difficult challenges, in order to accomplish your purpose, to bring people to yourself, to save people through Jesus. So help us to have that focus. Help us to have that assurance that, that it's worth it to follow you. It's worth it to struggle through those things because it works towards your purpose. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for continuing to teach us. Help us to learn and to be ready to apply something. We may have learned it years ago. We may have learned it just today. But help us to be ready to put it into practice, to glorify you and to, to proclaim the gospel in our lives. Thank you for just your presence with us always, that you never leave us or forsake us, that you want the very best for us and that you are continually at work in our lives and that you've given us your presence, your spirit within us. We thank you for that and for everything else that you do for us every day. In the name of Jesus, amen. Reigning high 
One evening this week, I stopped into a gas station to get gas. It was actually kind of late at night, and I was afraid that they might be closed. And so I rushed to get there, and I was glad to see the, the lights still on, and they were still open. So I told the attendant how much gas I wanted, and then I went inside to get a snack in the store. And as I walked in, I immediately noticed another customer who was in there. He was standing at the, the checkout counter, but he was gigantic. He was obviously way, way, way above average in height. And I was trying to kind of guess how tall he might be. And I got my snack and I was standing behind him and I was really tempted to ask him because I thought he's at least 6'10", maybe even taller than that. But I thought, look at this guy. He probably gets asked all the time. I mean, how many times a day does somebody go, hey, man, you're really tall. How tall are you? And I didn't want to be annoying or, or interrupt him. And so I thought, no, I don't need to ask him. But thankfully, the, the checkout guy did it for me. And so as they were kind of finished up the transaction, the guy behind the counter said, hey, by the way, how tall are you, man? And the guy said, seven feet. So I was right. He was taller than 6'10". He was seven feet tall. And it made me think, man, this guy probably gets asked, like I said, over and over and over again, because there's no way that he can hide how big he is. I even saw him driving away when I went back out to get in my truck. And it was obvious as he was driving his truck that he was huge in there. He was just looked tall, even sitting in his truck. There's no way that he could hide who he was, how, how big he was, how tall he was. 
But it made me think, you know, sometimes we do a pretty good job of hiding who we are, both, both in maybe hiding what we're going through, struggles, uh, difficulties, things that, that uh, we, we don't know how to handle, maybe temptations or, or mistakes that we've made. We, we try to just cover those up and pretend they're not there or, or hide them from other people. And sometimes we can be tempted or, or fall into the, the trap of, in our lives, just sort of hiding who we are in Jesus, not really talking about our faith, sort of leaving those spiritual things or things about our faith at home or at church. We just don't talk about those in a normal everyday life. But as we come to communion, we don't have to hide who we are. We can bring our struggles. We can bring our hardships. We can bring our mistakes and our sins and our shortcomings and we can bring those to Jesus and we can lay them at his feet and we can leave them there because he will take those. He will forgive us. He will help us to move forward and to overcome. And we're also told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that what I received I, I, from the Lord, I passed on to you that as you take the bread, which is his body and in the cup, which is his blood, do it in remembrance of him. And then in verse 26, it says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So as we take communion together today, we're proclaiming the death of Jesus. We're proclaiming who we are because we have new life because of the sacrifice that he paid. And I pray that this would be a beginning this week of just once of proclaiming the death of Jesus. And that as we go through each day, that we will continue to proclaim that, that our lives would speak clearly about the presence of Jesus in them through what we say and what we do, the, the love that we show, the compassion that we have for people, just the way that we live out our faith, that people would see that just as clearly as you see the height of a seven foot tall guy that, that stands out because he's so tall, that people would see that clearly the presence of Jesus in our lives and that they too would be drawn to ask what it is that is different about us. And we can tell them, we can proclaim to them that it's the death of Jesus, the sacrifice he made that's given us new life. So we remember the price that was paid for us as we take the bread to remember his body. And we take the juice to remember his blood. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance to remember, to reflect, to be honest about who we are and the mistakes we've made and the sin in our life and bring that to Jesus, ask for forgiveness. And we know that you're faithful to forgive because you told us that you would. Thank you that we can proclaim the death of Jesus. Celebrate that even though it was a horrible, tragic thing that happened that it has brought us new life and that we have a risen and living savior today and that we are alive in him. So we pray that not only would we proclaim that today as we take communion, but we would proclaim that each and every day through the lives that we live, that people would see Jesus in us and they'd be drawn to that and that they too would come to know him. So we thank you for the wonderful gift of new life in Christ and we pray in his name. Amen. This week in our small group, we talked about the story of Cain and Abel. And most of us are probably at least a little familiar with that story. Cain and Abel are two sons of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis. And uh, they're very different. Cain is a farmer who grows crops and Abel is a shepherd who has flocks out in the field. And in the end, Cain ends up killing his brother Abel. And God knows this, and, and God punishes Cain by banishing him out to the desert and taking away his ability to grow any crops. But the interesting thing is that this whole kind of sordid story started with an offering. Both Cain and Abel bring an offering to God. We're told that Abel brings the fat portions of the firstborn of his flock to God, and he gives that as an offering, and it just shows that he was grateful to God for all that he had. He brought him the first and best, trusting that God was going to bless him with everything else that he had and provide through the rest of what was left to bless Abel. And Cain, it says he brought some 
of the crops that he had grown as an offering for God. Not the first and the best, but he just brought some of what he thought would be enough to maybe make God happy. And God is pleased with Abel's offering and he's displeased with Cain. And Cain gets jealous and so that's why he lures his brother out into the field and he kills Abel. And it's easy to think it's, it was what they brought, the quality of what they brought or the amount of what they brought or, or God liked the, the meat better than the vegetables. But it wasn't the thing that they brought. It wasn't the amount that they brought. It was their heart condition that they brought to God. Abel gave because he was grateful, because he did it as an act of worship. And Cain gave because he had to. He thought it was, you know, he, he better do something. And so as we come to our time of giving, we have the opportunity to give the way that Abel gave. Not that we're going to give way more than anybody else. It's not about the amount. But we can come with the attitude of gratitude and, and of uh, faith that God is going to take a gift given out of gratefulness and out of a joyful heart. And he's going to then use all that we have left to work through us and to bless us as we acknowledge that everything that we have is a gift from him as we give our first and our best back to him. Thank you again for being here for worship. I hope you have a uh, happy and a safe rest of your 4th of July. I want to invite you back next week, 10.30 a.m. We'll be back here online and in person for worship at the church building. So let's pray as we get ready to sing our closing song this morning and, and uh, close for the day. Father, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your purpose. Thank you for making us part of that. Thank you for the redemption that we found in Jesus that we have been made a part of your family and your kingdom and your mission in this world. And we love you and we trust you and we thank you that uh, we can know that we are secure in you and that you are faithful to keep your promises. We rest in that fact and we, we step out into each day in faith, trusting that you will keep your promises and we want to be faithful to what you've called us to do as well. So give us the courage and the faith to do what you've called us to do, the be the people you've called us to be this week. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. No.
Everything I need. 